Yeah, am I clearly visible and clearly audible? Yeah, it's audible, sir. Okay. So, as has an it will be a live YouTube session, na? Yes, sir. It's directly YouTube live. Has it started? Yeah, sir. Just now it started, sir. You can start. So you should have told me, na? Shall we then? Uh, <coughs> should I start? Should I start, see, Jana? You can start, sir. No problem. You can start. Yes, sir. It's direct. Yes. So, can you all see the screen? And should I all begin? A very, very good evening to all of you. This is Dr. Vivek Goyer, your nephrology faculty at Doc Tutorials. And today we are about to begin with the NEET SS 2022 discussion for the medicine portion. And of course, I will be taking the nephrology part in the medicine paper. So I can see that very many people have already joined and rest of you have been messaging me since morning as to when will the session begin. So finally, this much awaited session will begin. And uh, I invite all of you to actively participate in the live chat and give in your comments, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, make it a very interactive session rather than make it a very boring one, which we of course do not want to make it. Now, first of all, let me give you a, a prelude that these questions and the options that have been given have been given by you only. So there might be a discrepancy in the recall options or the recall terminology or the wordplay of the question. So please do not get disarrayed if I have misinterpreted or you have miscommunicated me the option or the, uh, or the question. And so the answer has been something else. So I will try to discuss the topic as a whole. And if you have any question then and there, you can put forward and you can tell me that, sir, this was not the question. This was the, was the correct option. Is it correct? So let us begin. Let us begin. With the very first question. And the very first question was a 17 year old had a clinical condition and his urine output <coughs> excuse me, dropped to 0.25 ml per kg per hour for 24 hours. What is the AKI staging that what is the KDGO AKI staging? Now I have always been telling my students and those who were in my WhatsApp group which of course most of you were, you also know that I gave you a voice recording of all that was important just a day before. And I was very, very happy that seven to eight questions came directly from my those one minute, two minute voice recordings. 
so you know to my delight and to all the students delight i got a wonderful feedback the very next star after the examination com got completed and this also i had recorded and told you that the kdgo st aki staging where the stage one in the stage one the output is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 6 to 12 hours in stage 2 it is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than 12 hours and in kdgo stage 3 the patient either has less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour for 24 hours or an urea for more than equal to 12 hours so here you have seen that the urine output has dipped to how much to 0.25 which is of course less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour which has sustained for a period of more than 24 hours hence this is aki stage 3 there is nothing as known as kdgo aki stage 4 so of course this is what it is i hope i am clear to all of you so the first answer is kdgo stage 3 <coughs> excuse me now again a very very important but basic question came from hiv and nephrology that is an hiv positive patient presented with swelling of the body and for the urination the urine examination reveals severe proteinuria some of them even told me that the patient also had hypoalbuminemia so basically the you were asked what is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in an hiv patient now you know that the the hiv patient has a typical type of fsgs lesion in their kidneys and that is known as hewan which is hiv associated nephropathy and on histopathology the patient has a typical collapsing type of fsgs lesion which of course has the worst prognosis so the answer is not membranous nephropathy the answer is not mpgn now a very interesting option which some of you said that was there in the options was hivic what is hivic hivic is hiv associated immune complex kidney disease now please understand this hivic is by far the most common kidney biopsy finding in hiv patients right now after the advent of the anti retroviral therapy before art came into existence it was the hewan which was most common and still today it is in the african countries but in the non african countries where and of course after the advent of the anti retroviral therapy it is the immune complex kidney disease which is become, which has become the most common option now i see that very many of you are commenting that sir these options were different so i totally respect if the options were different i see that one of you have said that fsgs was the option so fine let me replace fsg and hewan with fsgs still fsgs remains the answer am i clear hewan is actually the name of a clinical entity fsgs is name of the biopsy finding am i clear good now hivic if it was not there in the option let me educate you with a different topic that it is the immune complex kidney disease which is overall the most common kidney finding in hiv positive patients but before the advent of the anti retroviral therapy it was the hewan which was the collapsing fsgs i hope i am absolutely clear to all of you so dr sai charan chitrak dr shelly sapra i hope all of you understood what i am the point i am trying to make good <clears throat> so as harrison's 21st edition says that 50% of hiv infected patients have a hewan on biopsy the lesion is fsgs and the characteristic variant of fsgs is collapsing glomerulopathy and this is what they asked you in the exam i hope i am absolutely clear clear now moving on to the third question again i have been constantly telling you dialyzable toxins if you remember that those one minute snippets that i had posted in the groups and the social media i told you the mnemonics 
for the dialyzable poisons and the non dialyzable poisons i always have been telling you that for a poison to be dialyzable what is the characteristic and that was the question itself so the questions was the dialyzable toxin must have a high volume of distribution small molecular mass and lipid solubility uh, it must be highly albumin bound it must have a low volume of distribution low molecular mass and water soluble it must have a low volume of distribution high molecular mass and water soluble so basically these were the options now you've got to understand that when you are removing a toxin extra corporeally to to an extra corporeal method be it a hemodialysis be it hemoperfusion of course you need it to be water soluble number 1 you need the toxin to be water soluble second of all you want it to be entering into least body compartments and you want the poison to be confined to the vascular compartment so you want the volume of distribution to be as low as possible thirdly you want the size of the molecule is as small as possible so that so the molecular weight is very low so that it easily passes if the molecular weight is low it means the radius is small if the radius is small it will easily pass through the dialysis filter am i clear and it is least protein bound or very minimally protein or albumin bound because you know albumin can't be filtered so if a poison should be least protein bound must have the lowest possible molecular weight must have the lowest possible volume of distribution and must be water soluble now seeing the best among the four options i think low volume of distribution low molecular mass and water soluble this is the best answer amongst the four options again you might be thinking that sir bit and your bit the option was bit here and there so it could be different permutation combination of these so you know i have been given these questions by you itself i fortunately didn't go to take the exam so do not get perturbed this is what the concept is and this is what the answer will be i hope i am clear to all of you as i always have told you these are the places where dialysis can be used so the molecular weight must be less than 500 daltons the volume of distribution should be less than 1 liter per kg low protein binding high water solubility high low endogenous clearance so basically when will you choose something to be dialyzed extra corporeally exogenously when it is not getting cleared endogenously so the endogenous clearance must be less than 4 ml per minute per kg i hope i am clear to all of you so it was relatively an easy question now again it was a sitter i have time and again told you this table from the harrisons where you have the difference between the pre renal and the intrinsic renal aki this is a very very important difference so which is true for pre renal azotemia is it the fena less than 1% fena is a fractional excretion of sodium less than 1% urine osmolality less than 350 milliosms urine by plasma creatinine less than 20 and bun by plasma creatinine ratio 10 to 15 that is less than 20 again <clears throat> now please understand this was fairly a simple question in pre renal azotemia where the body where the kidney is already hypoperfuse the kidney the, there is already a hypovolemic state the the kidney wouldn't want to lose much of sodium in the urine so the fractional excretion of sodium will be less so it is less than 1% is the correct answer rest if you did not even know you knew that this was the best option correct now because the kidney will try to conserve water the kidney will pass a concentrated urine so the urine osmolality actually will be higher than 350 in fact it could be even more than 500 in a pre renal azotemia now in a pre renal azotemia when the what when the kidney tries to reabsorb as much water the kidney also reabsorbs the urea from the proximal convoluted tubule more as a result the serum bun by creatinine ratio becomes more than 20 in pre renal aki so this is not the right answer this is not the right answer now in pre renal azotemia 
versus the intrinsic renal azotemia simply remember the plasma creatinine increases more in intrinsic renal AKI. So if it increases more in intrinsic renal AKI, it increases less in pre-renal AKI. And if it increases less, if the denominator is lesser, the ratio will be higher in pre-renal AKI, it will be lower in intrinsic renal AKI. I hope you are getting the concept. So this is the table that I have been referring to. As I was telling you, the bun by creatinine ratio, more than 20 is to 1, less than 20 is to 1. The urinary sodium, less than 20, more than 40. Fena, less than 1%, more than 2%. Urinary osmolality, less than 350, more than 500. <clears throat> As I told you in prenatal azotemia, it would be more concentrated. And the urine to plasma creatinine ratio, I told you, because the plasma creatinine is higher here, if the denominator is more, the ratio is less. And the denominator is lesser here, so the ratio is higher here. In short, in pre-renal AKI, BUN increases disproportionately more with respect to creatinine. In oliguric AKI, I mean in intrinsic renal AKI, it is the creatinine which increases more disproportionate to the BUN. I hope this is clear to all of you. And this is of course the formula of FINA. Moving on, the fifth question, a patient with E. coli infection was given gentamicin injections. Gentamicin is an aminoglycoside. The patient developed hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia. Probable cause was, was it Liddell syndrome? Was it Gittleman syndrome? Was it Barter syndrome? Was it Korn syndrome? Now, just by applying common sense, you could have negated two options here. If you have marked between these two options and got it wrong, I will still consider it okay. It is parable. But if anybody of you has marked little syndrome, that's a crime. Because you know little syndrome presents to you with hypertension, with hypokalemia. That's a totally different ball game. So does Korn syndrome. Korn syndrome is basically hyperaldosteronism due to a Adrenal adenoma. So that again has a different presentation. It presents with resistant hypertension, even a, I mean, hypokalemic weakness and all that. So that's a totally different ball game. Coming between Gittleman syndrome and Barter syndrome. Now, some of you told me that, sir, Barter syndrome type 5 was there in the options. If it was so, life would have been easier. But again, though it was though that because it was not unanimously told to me, so I'm not, con I'm considering it in bracket, whether or not type five mentioned or not, where all my students must be knowing all the five types of barters because we have discussed it time and again. Now, before giving the answer to this question, I would like to refer to some points which I have told you in my regular nephrology classes in my, in the chapter of AKI, where I discussed about aminoglycoside nephrotoxicity. So Dr. Chitrak said, says that sir, type 5 was there. So chalo, I removed this bracket and I man liya ki type 5 was there. So happy. Very happy. Shrey Bhatt also confirms the same. Excellent. Now, let me just show you what I taught you from the very beginning and any of the students who have seen my videos, you will, you cannot mark this wrong because I have taught you this. See, this is the slide which has which is there in my video. Aminoglycosides. Why is it known as aminoglycoside? Because they have an amino group. So they have amino groups that bind to, which are of course the cationic groups that bind to the anionic megalin, which is a receptor on the brush border of the PCT. It gets internalized, accumulates in the PCT, and it causes mitochondrial dysfunction, causing PCT dysfunction. And if it continues, it can even cause a globalized PCT dysfunction leading to Fanconi syndrome. This all of you must be knowing. I have discussed time and again. Now just see what happens here. This is the aminoglycoside and this is the amino group. This is internalized by this megalin, which has the anionic group. Ultimately, it is endocytosed and ultimately causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And the entire PCT gets dysfunctional. And that is why you can have certain features. 
Now coming to the nephrotoxicity, why was gentamicin only mentioned here? Because sir, most nephrotoxic aminoglycoside is neomycin. Least nephrotoxic is streptomycin. And genta, tobra and amica are intermediate. This is all you already know. Now, just see what I have taught you. You all know that aminoglycosides cause a non-oliguric AKI because the degree of tubular necrosis is very less severe compared to other ATNs. So usually non-oliguric AKI begins after 5 to 10 days of treatment and PCT involvement is a signature. I totally agree. But the distal tubular segments, by that I mean it can involve even the thick ascending loop of Henle and it can cause what? Polyuria, potassium wasting, magnesium and calcium wasting. So it can cause magnesuria and calciuria which would be quite subtle. Prolonged accumulation can occur even after the drug has been discontinued. So this is the exact slide that I have taught you time and again. Now just see. Coming back to the original question, you know that actually very many of you got confounded with hypomagnesemia. Now the classical teaching has been that hypomagnesemia is a cardinal feature of Gittleman syndrome and it is found in approximately 20 to 25 percent patients of Barter's. And it is found in approximately 100 percent patients of Gittleman. Okay. So here it's an overlapping feature because it could be Barter's, it could be Gittleman's. You are of, of course confused between the two. So Manlo, you have not studied any of my slides. You don't know what I have taught you. But if you were smart enough, you would have caught hold of this hypocalcemia. You know that Barter syndrome causes what? It causes hypercalciuria. Whereas Gittleman causes hypocalciuria. Somebody which is causing hypocalciuria can't cause hypocalcemia. It will actually lead to increased serum calcium. Now, usually Barter's does not cause hypocalcemia. Here comes the role of Barter's type 5. Because Barter's type 5 is, the, is what? It is the mutation. It is the gain of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptor on the basolateral aspect of the thick ascending loop of Henle. And that is why it is also known as autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. So if anybody knew this, which all of my students should, life would have been very, very easy for you. But just by hypocalcemia, you should have marked barters. And if there was type 5 barters, then so there is no question of not marking barters. I hope I'm absolutely clear to you. Please, those who have marked gentleman syndrome, this would be wrong. The answer would be Barter's syndrome type 5. Am I clear? And in the chat box, do you want to do you want to comment anything? Now, FHH, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, is just a mirror image of ADH. It is the loss of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. Whereas the gain of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptor is. Barter's type 5 or autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. Am I clear, Dr. Vinesoni? Is there any comment you would like to make at this juncture? We've completed five questions. Anything you want to say? Anything on you, you want to say? You want to comment? Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? The motive is not just to only tell you the answers, but also tell you in such a way so that in life you never commit this mistake again. Of course, by God's grace, none of you would have to appear for an exam again. All of you will be clearing through flying colors. I'm pretty sure. Should I move ahead? Chal. Chal. Now, again, this is a controversial question. Please, I'm not trying to pinpoint an answer here. I'm trying to give you the concept and the fallacy of the question. All are true for ADPKD except many of you said that there was an image based of polycystic kidney disease given in the question. 
totally agree so there must be large cystic kidneys drawn here all are true for adpkd except i mean what what is false about adpkd now first let me clear the very very easy ones ultrasound can be used for diagnosis of adpkd this is 110% correct isme koi shak hi nahi hai sacular aneurysms can lead to bleeding isme bhi koi shak nahi hai so there are intracranial aneurysms which the risk of which is 6% in patients who do not have a family history and 16% in patients who have a family history so anybody who has a family history of intracranial aneurysms will have a 16% risk of having ics and those who do not have it will have a 6% risk of having intracranial aneurysms so ye dono to excluded because ye dono to param satya hai the moment of truth both of them are absolutely correct what is false for adpkd now please please understand now dr shah's merchant said that the it was given young onset hypertension is uncommon is okay okay if that was the question life is easier for me now because why do i say that see mvp is a cause of sudden cardiac death now you've got to understand that mitral valve prolapse is present in approximately 25 to 30% patients of adpkd but harrison 21st edition says it brenner says it that it is usually asymptomatic so cardiac is the most common cause of death in adpkd but mvp behind the sudden cardiac death is absolutely not going with the option so according to me this is a wrong statement mvp does not cause death i hope i am clear now i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't you know endorse any unfriendly comments in the chat box please it has to be a very very it has to be a very very healthy discussion so dr shah's merchant says that it was given mvp is present in 50% patients that again is wrong because it is given present in only 25% of patients whatever be it mvp is a cause of sudden cardiac death is a wrong statement now young age hypertension or young onset hypertension is not a feature please understand that young onset hypertension is a feature of adpkd harrison says it let me quote harrison first what does harrison say please read this line these are snapshots from the harrison's 21st edition hypertension is common typically occurs before any reduction of gfr brenner's textbook of nephrology says that hypertension is almost present in most patients by the fourth decade of life so if in the 30s of adpkd patients if 70 80 90 percent patients have hypertension of course the onset happened even earlier so most probably hypertension has an onset in the 20s and by 30s most of them are hypertensive so hypertension is common and it occurs before any reduction of gfr it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease some normotensive patients with adpkd may even have lvh and hypertension results from what by the activation of the ras axis and sympathetic nervous activity i hope i am clear to all of you so hypertension is an early feature hypertension is not an early feature is a wrong statement mitral valve prolapse in a, occurs in up to 30% patients other valvular lesions can occur like may mitral aortic tricuspid valves insufficiency but most patients are asymptomatic this is the key line so moral of the story is young onset hypertension is not a feature is also a wrong statement is also a wrong statement so if like dr shah's merchant says if the question was young onset hypertension is uncommon so young onset hypertension is uncommon is again wrong because it is common 
and what do you have to mark you have to mark the false statement now out of the two actually both are false but again it will depend on the examiner here it will depend on where the from which point from which reference the examiner is quoting but i think among the two wrongs the statement which is grossly wrong is mitral valve prolapse is the cause of sudden cardiac death because first of all mvp is not present in 50% patients and it is not the cause of sudden cardiac death so the best answer here is mvp is cause of sudden cardiac death is a false statement i hope i am clear to all of you i have explained my point and i have tried to impress upon you the fact that why am i saying so i hope i am clear but again act honestly speaking both of them are correct but again who will make the answer key that you know such questions such fallacious questions are always there in entrance exams and you've got to go with the examiner you don't have a choice because you are a student okay now next question again was there in my voice note if anybody heard it the following features of marble brain disease so basically i was told that an x ray was given and a ct was given in a ct scan they showed a bilateral basal ganglia calcification and in the x ray what did they show they showed osteopetrosis of the femur with flared metaphyseal end at the lower end so basically they showed osteopetrosis ka features on the x ray and they showed brain calcification on the ct scan and you know that because there is brain involvement here and there is marble bone disease which is osteopetrosis only so both of them together is known as marble brain disease and this is due to the mutation of or loss of function of carbonic anhydrase type 2 that results in renal tubular acidosis type 3 and why is it type 3 because mathematically also 3 is equal to 2 plus 1 and in nephrology also 3 is equal to 2 plus 1 because it shares features of both rta2 and rta1 so it causes dysfunction of both the pct and the alpha intercalated cell of the cortical collecting duct i hope i'm clear to all of you this is again the reference quoted from the harrisons it's an autosomal recessive disease that causes osteopetrosis of the intermediate variety with rta which is rta type 3 and cerebral calcification so the answer is carbonic anhydrase type 2 deficiency i hope i am clear to all of you okay now again there was a question that that said ana is least helpful in now because you know i took up this question because you know that ana of course we do it for lupus and loop when you say lupus it means lupus nephritis of course to me as a nephrologist so i cannot go i mean cannot do away without ana so ana is least helpful in ra mctd systemic sclerosis or sle now you've got to understand mctd is actually an overlap syndrome Where, which has the combination of limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis sle ra and a polymyositis and it has an anti u1 rnp antibody associated with it also so sle of course ana is a very very important screening test it is a most sensitive test systemic sclerosis is associated with almost 100% positivity of ana mctd again has a very high positivity but ra has got nothing to do with ana so the answer is rheumatoid arthritis again this is a reference quoted from the kelly's textbook of rheumatology where all the ana has got its importance now a very important next question is a 12 year old male with sore throat hematuria presented with hem sore throat hematuria hypertension so there is a sore throat there is hematuria and there is hypertension which is young which is a young male so of course this is none other than a nephritic syndrome so you are dealing with 
a nephritic syndrome in a young male the swab gram stain and culture was negative c3 was below the reference range so the c3 was low symptoms resolved after 2 weeks so it was an acute nephritic syndrome which was probably caused by a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis after 2 weeks the symptom resolved so it was actually a self resolving disease but c3 was still low what is the next best step the options were as you told me it's a case of post infectious glomerulonephritis considering renal biopsy Uh, consider renal biopsy if c3 is low despite after another two weeks renal biopsy as it is probably ij nephropathy renal biopsy as it is probably npga or start oral steroids at 1 mg per kg per day now you've got to understand that you are dealing with a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis which is causing an acute nephritic syndrome which is beyond doubt because that's a very straight forward diagnosis now in psgn you do not give steroids because it's a self limiting disease it's not an mpgn it's a diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis it does not have nothing to do with i mean you do not suspect ij nephropathy because there is hypocomplementemia also so the best answer is that you will monitor the patient and if the patient has a low c3 despite 4 to 6 weeks from the onset of the disease then you will consider a biopsy to rule out c3 glomerulonephritis i hope i am clear to all of you now please see please see what the book says that in a the diagnosis is straight forward in a case of psgn but when there is oliguria lasting for more than one week or azotemia lasting for more than 2 weeks or hypocomplementemia lasting for more than 1 month then you got to do a kidney biopsy because usually the serological parameters all normalize within 1 month okay now all are features of primary hyperaldosteronism except so we did said something about corn syndrome also so basically primary hyperaldosteronism is basically over production of aldosterone from the adrenal gland it could be due to bilateral adrenal hyperplasia or it could be due to an adrenal adenoma which is known as a corns syndrome so you know when there is over production of aldosterone it leads to what over activation of the mineralocorticoid receptor on the principal cell of the cortical collecting duct which leads to what excess sodium reabsorption excess water reabsorption and potassium loss so the patient has what the patient has hypertension hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis this is the triad of hyperaldosteronism so there is resistant hypertension that the hypertension can be very difficult to control there can be hypokalemia and you can have an age of onset which is early but you do not have acidosis so the treatment is i mean the answer is metabolic acidosis because there is alkalosis and hyperaldosterone i hope i am clear to all of you moving on to the 11th question again i am pretty sure this again is a very very confusing question this again is a very controversial question a post operative patient on day 3 develop pain abg shows a ph of 7.45 a pco2 of 29 and a bicarb of 18 now you've got to understand that for practical purposes when solving an abg we consider the normal ph to be 7.4 though we know that the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45 so if the normal ph is 7.4 this ph is, is increased that means there is an alkalosis when there is an alkalosis you got to see whether it's a metabolic alkalosis or a respiratory alkalosis now please see all the options are i mean of course the options are i mean all the options are respiratory disorders so first of all acidosis is wrong which is beyond any doubt 
I hope I'm clear to you. Now, if it is an alkalosis, just see the PCO2 is normally how much? It is normally 40. From 40, it has come down to 29. So the PCO2 has decreased and the bicarbonate has also decreased from 24 to 18. So it is basically a respiratory alkalosis with a compensatory metabolic acidosis. Of course, we do not say about the compensation here. So it is basically a respiratory alkalosis. This is beyond any doubt that it is a respiratory alkalosis. Now, the question says, sir, whether it is acute or whether it is chronic. Now, this is the burning question which I have been getting in, in my messages day in and day out. Now, please understand there the question, the language of the question has to be very meticulously stated to us. See, the acuteness or chronicity depends upon the history. You can only understand whether it's an acute disorder or a chronic disorder depending upon the history. So acute or what is chronic respiratory alkalosis when the, when the disorder persists for more than three to five days. So if the respiratory alkalosis has persisted for at least more than 72 hours, only then can you say that it is a respirate, chronic respiratory alkalosis. Now, please understand that the patient has developed pain on day three. If it is on day three, then the patient, the question does not say the patient has pain for the last three days. If that was a question, then of course it would go more in favor of chronicity. If it is on day three, then it goes more in favor of acute. So historically, I think it is going more in favor of acute, which is very, very important clinching point. But if you try to solve this AVG further, if you try to see about the compensation, now please understand this table from Harrison's in respiratory alkalosis, what happens in acute respiratory alkalosis, the bicarb will decrease by 0.2 per 1 mmHg fall in PaCO2. So for example, if the PaCO2 falls by 10 mmHg, bicarb will decrease by 2. In chronic respiratory alkalosis, if the PaCO2 falls by 10 mmHg, the bicarb will decrease by 4 millimoles per liter. So if you try to solve this, the PaCO2 from 40 has become 29. So almost the PaCO2 has fallen by 10, almost yes or no. Now, how much the bicarb has decreased by? From 24, it has come down to 18. So it has come down by 6. If it has decreased by 6, if it was an acute disorder, then by 10, it should have decreased only by 2. So the bicarb should have been around 22, but it is 18. Now, some books, even some nephrology book says that this ratio, Harrison says is 4, but nephrology book says 5 to 6 also. So, if you take that benefit into account, if it is say 4 to 6, if I may consider so, then according to the compensation, the question goes more in favor of chronicity. Please try to understand this. Now, because these values were given to you, so I would like to believe that the examiner wanted you to solve this. And maybe that very many of you have not got hold of the exact language. Maybe it was from three days, from four days, or on day three or whatever. So again, I am still not committing to one answer between these two. But if this is the history, it goes more in favor of this. But the question as a whole and the compensation goes more in favor of this. So to be very honest, if I do not get the exact same question, I cannot tell you what it, what is what. So please do not get disheartened. Trust your own abilities. Most of you have solved this and in the exam. 
so let's see what the answer key has and what whatever is the is the best and the best for you will shall happen but i have solved the question for you the cron the abg goes more in favor of chronicity the history is the clinching point history will make the difference i hope i'm clear to you if any doubts you can ask me see what the harrison's 21st says chronic respiratory alkalosis occurs when hypocapnia persists for more than 3 to 5 days i hope i am clear to all of you okay good and of course chronic respiratory alkalosis is the most common acid base disorder in critically ill patients this is of course an mcq this is of course an mcq moving on to the 12th question a pretty straightforward question 48 year old female with a long standing diabetes history refer to a nephrologist with for evaluation of ckd hematuria and chronic flank pain so the gfr is around 58 ml per minute she gives an history with of frequent uti with e coli and an episode of oliguria due to urinary tract obstruction at present she is asymptomatic the kidney biopsy shows pass positive for me macrophages and multinucleated giant cells the history and biopsy findings are most consistent with now please understand most of you know that of course this is not active tb and this is not active pyelonephritis most of you know that most of you got confused in xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis and malacoplakia now please understand both of them are chronic granulomatous inflammatory response of the kidney to certain infections please understand that now but the the clinching point i have told in my videos also of xanthogranulomatous is lipid laden macrophages i asked very many questions this was not there in the options this was not mentioned this lipid laden macrophages imparts a yellow color to a xanthogranulomatous kidney and that is why it is known as xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis coming to what is malacoplakia please understand this malacoplakia is again a chronic granulomatous disorder it can involve different parts of the body there is an unusual inflammatory reaction to different infections because it is a monocyte macrophage bactericidal defect so basically basically it is a monocyte macrophage bactericidal defect so that the monocyte macrophage is not able to macrophage is not able to phagocytose the infection bacteria and that is why they cause a chronic in infection and it causes a chronic inflammatory response how does it manifest it manifests in the form of macrophages with calcifying debris called michelis gutman bodies i asked very many students whether this word was mentioned there in the question or not but it was not there so i cannot quote it in the question now how does it appear it appears as a granulomatous reaction dominated by macrophages with cytoplasm that is pass positive and may have gram positive cocobacillary forms okay ct shows poor areas of enhancement it is indistinguishable nephrectomy is recommended for advanced unilateral cases so for the biopsy given the best answer would be malaco plakia i hope i am clear to all of you coming to coming to the next question an 11 year old child presented with periorbital edema and swelling of the body the dipstick urine showed 3 plus proteinuria so basically it is a childhood onset nephrotic syndrome what is the next best step again the options were very very scattered but again you know in a childhood onset nephrotic syndrome the best 
the most probable etiology being minimal chain disease you do not do a kidney biopsy you straight away treat the patient with empirical steroid therapy and only if there is steroid resistance do you go for a biopsy or if there is a frequent relapsing or whatever that's a separate story so it is a steroid therapy is the next best step this is a very very straightforward question again a very simple one liner sine wave pattern you do know that the ultimate ecg finding of hyperkalemia when the potassium exceeds above 8.5 milli equivalents per liter that is sine wave pattern which we have discussed time and again it was there in the test also it is hyperkalemia again a very very ecg uh, simple ecg question this is what i would assimilate from the students what is true about ecg findings in electrolyte disorders hypocalcemia causes short qt no hypocalcemia causes prolonged qt interval hypercalcemia causes long qt no it causes short qt hypomagnesemia causes short qt no it causes prolonged qt so all these options are wrong and i have not yet got the fourth option if somebody has it please you can give it to me right now so please remember this famous dictum all hypos prolong qt so whether it is hypocalcemia hypokalemia hypomagnesemia all hypos prolong qt so i have not got the fourth option whatever it was that was the correct answer am i clear am i absolutely clear to all of you any doubt now please you have you got to be a bit more patient and lenient with me as well because you got to understand i did not go and take the exam so this is qu the question that i have not made up myself this is not a fiction paper this is what i have assimilated from the students and trust me i did not record it yesterday or the day before because i was getting very skewed options and questions so i took some time i individually messaged very very many students and asked them and then i took the common part of the venn diagram okay so you've got to be understanding with this now coming to again very favorite portion of mine i have recorded a live youtube video on this on the urinary anion gap and the renal tubular acidosis very simple straight forward question the urine anion gap formula is you know that the urine anion gap formula is urine sodium plus urine potassium minus urinary chloride and students told me sir it was in all permutation combinations so i made those permutation combinations and the answer is of course this and you know why it was mentioned because in rtas the urinary anion gap is always positive i have told i have this has been i mean reiterated to death so many times i have told you guys about this thing yes any comments any comments from the students anyone would like to comment anything dr vinay soni says i forgot the option but hypomagnesemia was the so maybe it was hypomagnesemia prolonged qt that was the option given maybe i have been asking you time and again the whatsapp groups that is what i could assimilate okay whatever you know the main crux of the matter now and that is what you marked so don't worry okay now little syndrome is due to the gain of function mutation of i have been telling you i this was asked to me some hours before the exam and i have recorded a voice note on little syndrome and same for those who know they know kyunki jinko pata hai unko pata hai why i am saying this and this is such an easy and important question that has been told to you clear am i clear so little syndrome is due to the gain of function mutation of the inac channel on the principal cell of the cortical collecting duct time and again i have told you is it clear 
good very very simple now if i have to solve this this mutation if it get it gets mutated loss of function wise that can lead to same if this has a loss of function mutation it can lead to barters and this has a gain of function mutation it can lead to gordons now duration of action of insulin for hyperkalemia is now i do not remember in which live session but i have asked you this in my uh, class test also of electrolyte disorders this was mentioned duration of action for insulin of insulin for hyperkalemia this table itself was discussed the calcium has a duration of action of around 1 hour 30 to 60 minutes insulin has a duration of action of 4 to 6 hours the beta to salbutamol that is beta to agonist has a 2 to 4 hour action and sodium polystyrene sulfonate again has a 4 to 6 hour action but it is it takes a longer time it takes around 2 hours to act and that is why one of the fastest acting drug to treat hyperkalemia is insulin because calcium of course it acts very fast but it does not decrease the serum potassium it only stabilizes the membrane so insulin starts in 30 minutes and stays for 4 to 6 hours very very straight forward easy one liner answer is 4 to 6 hours so the electrolytes were discussed in details in the qrp sessions also i discussed every possible electrolyte that could have been asked to you and see you are getting so many questions out of there now again voice note sent some hours before i gave you a very important voice notes on febris thin basement membrane disease and alport syndrome and i told you time and again febris disease ke skin mein ek pathognomonic skin finding is found which is known as angiokeratoma angio means blood vessels kera means skin oma means tumor or swelling so it's a swelling of the blood vessel of the skin it called it known as known as angiokeratoma and this is known as angiokeratoma corporis diffusum which is present on the trunk the torso and the thighs so again a very very sitter question angiokeratoma is seen in which syndromic nephropathy answer is febris disease am i clear now again please do not get disturbed this question again i have got different values from different questions but i understood the crux and i have made this question somehow a 45 year old male presented with polyuria so basically the the patient had polyuria and whatever features were given the students could not recall it it was suggestive of diabetes insipidus chalo maan liya because sare options hi di hai so i am so happy now you gave the patient desmopressin what is desmopressin it is a synthetic adh analog so you are basically giving vasopressin synthetic vasopressin to the patient now when you give vaso now basically what is di di is basically either the quality or the quantitative dysfunction of the anti diuretic hormone so it is not working either it is not there that is known as cdi if or either it is there but there is resistance that is known as ndi that is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus after giving desmopressin the urinary osmolality should have what when you give adh that is an anti diuretic hormone so it will cause more reabsorption of the water and it will cause what less of water in the urine so the urine osmolality should be increased yes or no it should increase now the urine osmolality increased to less than 30% that which increased to around 280 so it was it was somebody had told it was 220 before now it has become 280 this is what somebody told me from 220 it became 280 but it increased only to about 30% now please understand first of all first of all if after giving desmopressin the urine osmolality should increase leaps and bounds okay somebody says urine osmolality 110 serum osmolality 280 i don't know what are you talking about 
nobody has told me these things nobody has told me these things in this question i don't know if there was some other question or not i was not told about that question so basically basically what somebody told me what the students told me was after giving desmopressin the, the urine osmolality responded but not adequately so for this you've got to understand something what is known as a water deprivation test and a desmopressin challenge test now please understand the basis for that first dekho in water restriction what do we do basically the motive is to differentiate between first a uh, psychogenic polydipsia and di so what do we do we restrict water if after restriction of water the urinary osmolality normalizes it means what the patient was actually the patient was actually drinking more water and that is why the problem was happening but despite water restriction if the problem persists then it is known as a diabetes insipidus so by water restriction you understood whether it is a polydipsia versus a diabetes insipidus now if it is di you've got to understand whether it is a cdi or an ndi or whether it's a partial cdi or a partial ndi or a complete cdi or a complete ndi how can you do that you can do that by judging the response to the desmopressin now what do you do after you give a desmopressin if the urinary osmolality rises it should rise because it should become more concentrated but it becomes less than 15% to a value of less than 300 here it is approximately 30% the butter value less than 300 that is a complete nephrogenic di so the kidney is totally resistant there is urine osmolality does not increase only less than 15% means what almost negligible but if the urine osmolality increases to 15 to 45% to a reasonable range but the value does not surpass 300 that's a partial nephrogenic ndi i told you if it was a central di desmopressin should have acted magic the urine osmolality should have been risen by leaps and bounds by more than 100% and here also by more than 50% it could approach even a, by 200% but both the cases the urine osmolality should have become more than 300 but here it's a very very touch and go so it cannot be central di be it partial be it complete because if central di would be there the urine osmolality would have increased leaps and bounds it has to be nephrogenic di if it's a complete nephrogenic di then nothing would have responded but yeah so there has been a response from 220 to 280 but not past 300 and the response has been by approximately 30% so among these options the best answer is partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus i think i have written partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus twice so yeah so the best answer is wait let me reform the so options were partial central di complete central di partial nephrogenic di complete nephrogenic di i hope these were the options the best answer is partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus i hope i am clear to all of you so this is the best answer now dr shutanjay odak says sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus bicarbonate was there in the option for urine and iron gap if it was there in the option then this has to be the right answer please understand one thing urine and iron gap is basically the difference between urinary cations minus urinary anions so urinary cation is sodium plus potassium and urinary anion is chloride plus bicarbonate in normal circumstances the urine excretes zero bicarbonate there is zero bicarbonate in the urine that is why we do not count it only so we have simplified the formula urinary sodium plus potassium minus urinary chloride so if bicarbonate was there that is our the right answer if bicarbonate is not there then also it is the right answer am i clear because despite being there it does not create a any difference to the answer so these were the 20 questions 
that the students reported to me with whatever options i could gather i am very sorry if it has some way differed from the actual ones because as i said i myself didn't go to take the exam i have tried to do it with the best of my abilities do not worry students all of you were very good you have done your best now please leave the rest to the almighty okay okay so arpit says that the osmolarity increases to 30% that is fine i am okay less than 30 30 30 okay i'll take the mean figure 30 still the answer will be partial nephrogenic di okay there was a question on proteinuria please tell me what was the question i'll be more than happy to answer on proteinuria so with this we have come to the end of today's discussion it was again a you know very very short discussion among of the questions this these are my contact details this is my whatsapp number this is my twitter id and this is my telegram id so dr bhattacharya if you can find any question which was asked that was on proteinuria you could please whatsapp it to me at my number and we i'll discuss the question there and i'll put this solution on the answer as well okay so these are my contact details and uh, if there is any doubt i will be more than happy to answer you guys i am so so happy that you guys have understood what i have tried to told, tell you okay okay so all the very best and please do understand that this is not the end of the game you have a much bigger game very very few people have the tenacity to wait for the inisss but those people do trust me they benefit a lot there were many students who did not get through neat neat ss last year they stuck with us they subscribed to our video course which has a very short compact course within 50 60 70 hours i have recorded the entire nephrology which is given at a very affordable price at doc tutorial so you can subscribe to it and still if you require any help i am there all by your side 24/7 you have my whatsapp number you come into my group i'll add you there we'll keep discussing case vignettes and we'll sail through this tide together i'll hold your hand as much as my as much as possible with the best of my abilities so with this i would like to thank you all for patiently listening and i welcome any comments any messages that you can ask me thank you very very much very good night to all of you thank you